نحمد و نسلی علی رسول الکریم اما بعد فاعوز باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى آل ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى آل ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد وعن امير المؤمنين ابي حفص عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول انما الاعمال بالنيات وانما لكل امرئ ما نوى فمن كانت هجرته الى الله ورسوله فهجرته الى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته لدنيا يصيبها بامراه ينكحها فهجرته الى ما هاجر اليه متفق عليه That is, this hadith has been reported by both Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, rahimahumallah. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlu luqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Allahumma rabbana alhimna rushdana wa aizna min shurur anfusina. Allahumma arina alhaqqa haqqan warzuqna attiba'ah wa arina albaatila baatila warzuqna ajtinaabah. Ameen, ya rabbal alameen. With the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we begin our study of Al-Arba'in al-Nawawi. That is the collection of 40 ahadiths. Although actually, this collection contains 42 ahadiths. But the title of the book is Al-Arba'in al-Nawawi. This collection was comp compiled by Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah, in the third, third, 13th century of the Christian era and 7th century Hijrah. And the background of this collection is that there is a hadith. Although it is accepted to be zaif, weak as regards the riwayah, but so many Sahaba have communicated this hadith that it has been accepted universally, these are hadith. This hadith says, Man hafiz ala ummati arba'ina hadithan, whosoever remembers for my ummah, that is remembers, memorizes, and then conveys to my ummah, 40 of my hadith, He will be counted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amongst ulama and fuqaha. As regards the authenticity of this hadith, it is not very powerful. But as regards the acceptability of this hadith, that is nearly universal. So actually, this hadith became an incentive for many ulama to compile their own collections of 40 ahadiths. And these are called Al-Arba'een. And there are so many Al-Arba'een. Many of them have compiled them. This is Al-Arba'een Lil-Nawawi, Imam Sharfuddin and Nawawi. And this has been universally accepted and this has become most important and most famous. Although there are so many other Arba'een edited by other ulama. But this is universally accepted. Imam Nawawi died in the year 676. That is, he belongs to the 7th century of Hijrah. And the 13th century of Christian era. He compiled this collection of ahadiths which contains 42 ahadiths of the Prophet ﷺ. Most of the other people, the first one who compiled the 40 ahadiths was Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak rahimahullah. He is from Tabi'i Tabi Tabi'een. 
that is the third generation after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first generation, that is Sahaba, who saw and who were companions of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the second generation, Tabi'een, who didn't see and meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they had the fortune, they were fortunate enough to have the company of the companions of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are called Tabi'een. And then Tab'a Tabi'een, people who could be fortunate enough to have the company of the Tabi'een. So Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, rahimahullah, he belongs to this third generation. And about these three generations, the Prophet has said that these th generations are most fortunate. They are the best of the Ummah. A Sahaba, awwalan, first of all, Sahaba, then Tabi'een, and then the Tab'i Tabi'een. So Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah, he belongs to that third generation of Tab'i Tabi'een, and he compiled the first collection of 40 Ahadis. So this, and then so many ulama, they have compiled their own collections. But everyone has his own angle of view, point of view for collection and choosing. Somebody has collected ahadis regarding Iman only. Somebody has collected ahadis regarding the best and virtuous acts in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone has compiled 40 ahadis regarding most important issues of fiqh that should be known to every Muslim. But this compilation, this collection of 40 or 42 ahadis by Imam Nabawi rahimahullah, he died in the year 676, as I told you. So he chose the ahadis from different branches of knowledge, which are most fundamental. Fundamental regarding the basic principles of Islam. Fundamentals regarding is Iman, what are the articles of faith. Then the fundamentals regarding the inner sophistication, inner purification of the soul, which is usually termed as tasawwuf. This is a new term. It was not there in the days of the Prophet, nor in the days of Sahaba, nor in the Tabi Tabi'in, Tabi'in and Tabi Tabi'in. Later on, this term was introduced in our realm. But I am using that term to make it easy for you to understand that some ahadis here are, which basically are concerned with the inner purification of the heart or the soul. So he has taken some ahadis from this, this aspect, some ahadis from that aspect, some ahadis from that aspect. And that is why it is the most accepted collection of 40 ahadis. Al-Arba'in lil Nawawi, Imam Sharfuddin al Nawawi, Rahimahullah. Now this hadith, this first hadith, which is included in this collection, and that is the most important hadith regarding the fact that most of the muhaddisin, whether he is Imam Bukhari or Imam Muslim or someone else, they have, they started their collections of ahadith with this hadith. So, so to say, this is like Surah Al-Fatiha. Because most of the people who have compiled collections of ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, they begin with this one. Because it discusses the intention, purity of intention, which is the first condition of the acceptability of any good deed, any virtuous deed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not going to accept any deed, howsoever virtuous it appears. Howsoever grand it appears, but if there is not sincerity behind it, if there is some pollution in the intentions, then that act, that act of piety is not acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this al-ikhlas fin niyyah, so every muhaddis, <coughs> somewhat, every muhaddis, Nearly every muhaddis who has compiled his collections of ahadis, whether Sahih or Musnad or someone else, they bring this hadith as number one. In the same way, 
آل دو دی موسٹ پروفاؤنڈ حدیث آف دی پروفٹ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم از حدیث نمبر ٹو موسٹ پروفاؤنڈ بٹ دی پریکٹس آف دی محدسین ہیز بین دیٹ دے بگن دیئر کلیکشن وتھ دس حدیث اٹ ڈسکسز دی پیورٹی آف انٹینشن اے ڈیڈ اینڈ ایکٹ آف پائٹی ہاؤ سو ایور گرینڈ اٹ مائٹ اپیئر اف اٹ از ناٹ موٹیویٹیڈ اونلی by the urge to get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to get the reward in the hereafter. If there is attached some worldly motivation, something that you want as a reward in this world, howsoever virtuous that act may appear, but it, is, it will be, so to say, multiplied by zero in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the basic issue discussed in this hadith. عن امیر المومنین ابی حفص عمر ابن الخطاب رضی اللہ عنہ دی نریٹر آف دس حدیث از حضرت عمر رضی اللہ تعالی عنہ ابی حفص از ہز کنیہ خطاب واز دی فادر عن امیر المومنین اینڈ دس از دی ورڈ وی یوز فار خلفاء راشدین ہی از دی سیکنڈ پائس کیلف آف دی پروفٹ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم عن امیر المومنین ابی حفص عمر ابن الخطاب رضی اللہ عنہ قال سمعت رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم یقول he says or he said that I myself heard the apostle of Allah saying now the ahadith they can be begin with the only word of an it has been reported from him not saying that the person from whom it is being reported has heard it from directly from the Prophet There is a possibility that another Sahabi, another companion of the Prophet might have heard it from the Prophet himself. And then some other Sahabi or companion of the Prophet might have heard, might have heard that from that companion. But Samir too, that is, you know, it adds emphasis. Samir to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I myself heard the Prophet, the Apostle of Allah, saying, now this is the text of the Hadith. إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ The virtuous acts will be judged according to the intentions behind them. Although this word amal, usually it is used for virtuous acts also, and for bad deeds also. But mostly, this word is used for virtuous acts, acts of piety. This is the basic difference between fail and amal. Fail, any deed, any action is fail, whether it is bad or good, whether it entails hard labor or it is easy. But the word amal in Arabic that is primarily used for something which requires hard effort, which is not very acceptable to the id or libido of human beings. A man has to exert to commit that act. That is amal. And mostly it is used for virtuous acts. Because our id or libido, our baser self, it requires requirements, its desires, they are so inherent in our body that these acts we perform without any labor. We don't have to compel ourselves or force ourselves to do it because all the motivation is already within us. No additional effort is required. But for some virtuous act, you have to exert yourself. Amal. Something which entails effort and exertion. So the virtuous acts definitely need exertion on the part of the person and to undergo some hardship. In the malamal, so that is why I have translated it verily, the virtuous acts, the acts of piety, bil amal, in the malamal bin niyat. Niyat is the plural of niyah. This is commonly used in Urdu also. We pronounce it as niyat. 
But this is niyyah in Arabic. And the plural is niyyat. Inna malamalu bin niyyat. All the good deeds, the virtuous acts, will be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the basis of the intentions. What was the intention? Somebody is doing some very pious act, but he is only performing that act to show off his piety. According to another hadith of the Prophet, this is shirk. Man salla yurai faqad ashraka. Wa man tasaddaqa yurai faqad ashraka. Wa man saama yurai faqad ashraka. Whosoever prays to show off his piety, to show to the people, he is committing shirk. Whosoever is fasting, but he only wants to show it off. He is committing a shirk. The worst crime in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this ayah appears twice in Quran. Inna Allah la yakfiru wa yushraka bih wa yakfiru madhu nadalika li man yasha. Allah is not going to forgive that shirk may be committed with him. Something or someone is associated with him. Is accepted to be equal to him. This is not going to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the other sins. Maybe that Allah may forgive them. Not that there is an open license that all the other sins will be definitely forgiven. No. But it can be hoped that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might forgive it. But not shirk. And here the Prophet Lord has a farriya to show off your piety. He has termed it shirk. Faqad ashraka. And qad ashraka in Arabic means definitely there's no doubt about it. It has happened. It's the present perfect tense. He has committed this. I have done this. The present perfect tense in English. Qad ashraka. He has already committed shirk. So, man salla yurai faqad ashraka, wa man saama yurai faqad ashraka, wa man tasaddaqa yurai faqad ashraka. Whosoever prays, is praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but to show off to the people. He has committed shirk. Whosoever keeps the fasting, the psalm, he is fasting, but he wants to show it off to the people, that he is a very pious person. He keeps so many additional fasts, a psalm nafl. So if he is doing it to show off, he, has commit, he is committing shirk. And if he is giving charity, but to show it to the people, he is committing shirk. So all the good deeds are going to be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the virtuous acts will be judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the basis of the intentions. Bin niyat. Wa inna ma li kulli mreem ma nawa. Now this sentence is only for adding emphasis to it. Inna ma la maalu bin niyat. It's complete. But then, wa inna ma li kulli mreem ma nawa. Every person will get only what he had intended. The action might be, the act might be very virtuous. But he intended only to please people, to get some worldly reward, to get some praise from the people, that he is a very virtuous person. He is a very virtuous person. He commits good deeds, nawafil, and so on. But he will not get anything out of it except what he had intended. That is, if he intended that he should be known as a pious person, he will be known in this world as a pious person. People will take him to be a pious person. But you know, in the hereafter, there will be nothing for him. There's another hadith and that is you know, very alarming, very alarming, very alarming, that on the day of the judgment, first of all, three persons will be judged. Number one, who had fought in the world in his life, for the cause of Allah, and people were thinking that he is shaheed. The other one, who had a lot of wealth, and he was distributed in arms and charity, he was giving it to the people. And the third one, 
you know, I forget the third one. Dr. Sami might be remembering. Ah, but someone who is very knowledgeable. And you know, knowledge is the biggest virtue in the eyes of Islam or Iman or Quran. Innama yaksha Allah bin ibadihi ulama. That is the biggest virtue. But if he wants only to impress upon people that he is a very, very knowledgeable person, he is a lama. If this is the real intention, then what will happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the person who fought for the cause of Allah, no doubt. He was, for example, among the Sahaba and the Prophet himself in some, some battle. But you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let him know, I gave you good strength, healthy body, and so on. What did you do for me? He will say very happily, oh Allah, I fight, I fought for your cause. To make your kalama supreme. I fought along with your prophet. But Allah will say, no. You are telling a lie. You fought. So that people should say, he is a very brave person. To show off your bravery. That was the real intention behind your act. And that you got in the, in the world. People praise you that he is very brave. Your reward has already been given to you. You have already received the reward. There's nothing here for you. And then the angels will be ordered and he will drag him on his face. Allah And throw him into the fire of hell. The same will be the case with the big alim and also with the wealthy person who spent lot of money in charity. But you know the intentions were not pure. They wanted that they should become famous. His fingers should point towards him. Oh, he is a very big alim. He is a very charitable person. So these things will make their act zero on the day of judgment. Now a very beautiful example has been given here by the Prophet Whosoever migrated from Makkah to Medina solely to please Allah to Obey the command of his apostle Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa There was no additional, no other motive behind it. Solely, wholly to please Allah. To obey the command of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So his hijrah, his migration will be counted in this account, in the same account. It will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the true hijrah which he has performed for Allah and his messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa But whosoever has migrated to get some worldly reward. Now the best example could be that supposing there was a Mumin, a Muslim shopkeeper in Makkah. And you know, most of his customers, because it was a 23 years, a 13 years long history. Definitely the Kufar and Mushrikeen might have stopped buying from him. And the only customers left for him were the Muslims. They came to buy or purchase something from him. And now when he saw that most of the Muslims have migrated, now he also is migrating. Now, this migration is not pure in intentions. He is migrating for something which is worldly, this worldly. Some worldly reward. If that is what is intended really in the hearts of his heart, he, all, he is making this migration and hijrah only because 
all his customers have gone and now for his bread and butter he is compelled to migrate وَمَنْ كَانَتْ حِجْرَتُهُ لِلدُّنْيَا يُسِيبُهَا اب امراتی یعنی کی ہوها اور if he is migrating solely because a woman a Muslim مومن woman whom he wanted to marry has migrated now there is no choice left for him except to migrate if he wants to marry her he has also to leave Mecca and go to Medina and it is said that, that there was a person who was known among the people as Muhajiro Umm Qais Umm Qais was a woman she migrated and somebody who loved her wanted to marry her he also migrated so aw imra'ati yankihuha fa hijratuhu ila ma hajara ilayh so now the hijrah the migration and this hijrah is one of the three acts which have been enumerated by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that they can become kafara for all the sins which a person might have committed before that act these are three number one if a person becomes muslim he was a kafir no sooner than he you know crosses the line he becomes a mu'min now all the bad deeds all the crimes all the sins which he committed before becoming a mu'min and muslim they are pardoned in the same way the second one is hijrah a person is leaving his place of birth the place of his ancestors where his ancestors are buried and he definitely loves that place he has friends his rela- relations relatives are there and when the prophet said now migrate to madina you know the first migration that was made towards habasha ethiopia of today that was voluntary whosoever wants to go whosoever cannot stand the persecution that is going on in makkah if he wants he can migrate that was optional that was not compulsory but this second migration to madina was compulsory even to the extent that it was declared whosoever doesn't migrate oh muslims you have no relation with him now ma lakum min walayatihim min shay'in hatta yuhajiru unless they migrate because this this migration was actually to start the initiative the offensive against the kuffar and to begin with that in this that you know offensive or initiative against kuffar of makka it was absolutely necessary the all the force which is available must gather at one place if the force is scattered some muslims are here some are there some are in that tribe some are in that tribe and so on this scattered force could not take that head on collision with the quraish of makkah there should be that all the strength which is available all the people who have accepted iman up till this date they must come to one place so that that place becomes the base for the offensive that is to be now undertaken against kufr and the aimmat al kufr they were quraish faqatilu aimmat al kufr and to you know go to war against this aimmat al kufr all the available human force should gather first at one base so it was compulsory man kanat hijratuhu ila allah wa rasulihi fa hijratuhu ila allah wa rasulihi wa man kanat hijratuhu li dunya yusibuha ab imrati yan ke hoha fa hijratuhu ila ma hajra ilayh allah has nothing to do with it that is he will get no reg- no reward on this which is one of the three highest acts in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa taala i was telling you first is coming over to islam from kufr the second is hijra and the third is al hajjul mabrur but mabrur is the condition that hajj which is free from all pollution the intensity 
the intention should be pure the money with which you are performing that hajj should have been earned from halal not haram and then all the basic conditions that are prescribed there they should be done in the best of the way al hajjul mabrur so these are the three acts of piety you may call them three virtuous acts which cancel all the previous bad deeds or sins and the man becomes as if he is born now today this the second birth as you know in christian world rebirth in jesus so in that way it is rebirth in islam because now all the previous acts all the previous acts and sins they stand nullified but this also needs the purity of intention so this hadith has been narrated by imam bukhari and imam muslim both and the hadith about whose authenticity these two biggest muhaddisin they agree it becomes the highest level of the authenticity of hadith it comes very near to quran very near quran is also a hadith fa bi ayyi hadithin ba'duhu you read it in quran is actually quran is hadith hadithullah is quran and what we call hadith is hadithur rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam so the chain of narration only one link is more that quran has been narrated conveyed to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam by the archangel jibril and then it has been you know can communicated from muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the sahaba rizwanullah taala alayhi wa jami'in and from the sahaba to the tabi'in and from the tabi'in to the tabi'i tabi'in so on generation after generation so this hadith of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam about whose authenticity both imam muslim and imam bukhari agree this is the highest level of the authenticity of any hadith which comes very near to the quran now you have only this first hadith the text of this hadith is with you so let me give you at least the introduction the second hadith the second hadith included in this compilation or collection of ahadith by imam sharafuddin an-nawawi rahimahullah this is the most profound hadith of all the ahadith so much so that the scholars the muhaddisin they have given it the title ummu sunnah just as surah al-fatiha this is ummul quran um the mother or um the basis the root this word you know means all such things so ummul quran surah al-fatiha ummu sunnah this hadith which is commonly known as hadith of jibril alayhi salatu wassalam and this is narrated by many sahaba because as we will, we will see later this happened in a gathering so many sahaba were present and in that in the presence of so many sahaba and the prophet himself sallallahu alaihi wasallam this event happened so so many sahaba have narrated it for example umar ibn al-khattab radhiyallahu anhu his son abdullah ibn umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhuma ibn abbas radhiyallahu ta'ala anhuma abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala an so many sahaba have narrated it and it discusses with some very fundamental issues of a time when islam becomes a polity when islam has become the basis of a society when an islamic state has been established you know the fundamental things before islam has been established in the form of a state 
دے وڈ بی پرٹیننگ ٹو ایمان اینڈ جہاد دے آر دی ٹو موسٹ فنڈامینٹل سبجیکٹس ڈسکسڈ بٹ وین اسلام ہیز بیکم ہیز گیون برتھ ٹو اے سوسائٹی اٹ ہیز ٹیکن دی شیپ آف اے اسٹیٹ دے از این اما ناؤ پیپل آر بیکمنگ مسلمس بیکاز دے ور بارن آف مسلم پیرنٹس to begin with there were the people who had to leave their own faiths own beliefs leave their families clans they had to undergo so much sacrifice to accept islam but later on when the parents are muslim the offspring they are muslims generation after generation they are muslims now what are the fundamental issues that must be understood about these ahadith and about these issues امام ابو حنیفہ ہیز بین سیٹ ٹو کمپائل دی اونلی بک الفق الاکبر ہی ہیز ناٹ کمپائل اینی بک امام ابو حنیفہ رحم اللہ ہی اونلی ٹرینڈ ہز ڈسائپلس اینڈ دی ڈسائپلس دین روٹ بکس ہی ہم سیلف واز ناٹ این آتھر وی مے سی ہی واز آتھر آف مین ناٹ آتھر آف بکس The only book that is attributed to him is Al-Fiq Al-Akbar and that discusses with these fundamental principles. What is Iman? What is Islam? What is Ihsan? The three basic, most fundamental questions, they were put to the Prophet ﷺ and he answered them. Because Islam is the basis of the membership of Muslim society. Whosoever is a Muslim, we accept him as a Muslim in our society. This is the basis of citizenship, full citizenship in Islamic State. Whosoever is a Muslim, he will be accepted as a full citizen of the Islamic State. Today we only reserve this place for the heads of the states. In most of the Muslim countries, you will find in the constitutions that only a Muslim can be the head of the state, the president or the prime minister. But actually in Islamic state, the legislature cannot have any non-Muslim person in it because the basis and the source of legislation is Quran and Sunnah. So only those who believe in Quran and Sunnah, they can be accepted in the legislature. They are entitled to make ishtihad, not those people who don't believe in Allah or don't believe in Quran and don't believe in Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in sunnah. So these are very fundamental questions, very fundamental. For us today, they are only theoretical importance, nothing more. Because we are living in alien societies comprising of non-Muslim majority. And even in the countries where we Muslims are in majority, we have the same secular systems. The only thing that you have put in the the constitution of most of the Muslim countries is that the head of the state will be a Muslim. Now it becomes a very big fundamental legal question. Who is a Muslim? And who is not a Muslim? So what is Iman? What is Islam? And what is the height of the purity or an intensity of Iman? So these fundamental questions are solved by Muhammad himself. صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ان دس حدیث ام السنہ حدیث جبرائیل and this was an incident that happened and it was very so to say unusual incident but because so many sahaba were present in the mosque along with Muhammad صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم so so many people saw this event happening so everyone he narrated that event but Please note here a very fundamental point. The narrations given by different Sahaba, there is difference in wordings, not in the essence, but only in wordings. Even the sequence of questions is different. For example, the hadith, this, the narration of this hadith, which Imam Bukhari has accepted is from Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and in that the sequence of questions was 
first of all what is iman the second question was what is islam and then the rest of the two questions and you know the level of the hadith which is accepted by both imam bukhari and imam muslim this is again accepted by imam muslim only also so that is higher this hadith is higher regarding the authenticity but the most accepted hadith most famous narration of this hadith is from hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala and here we find a different sequence of questions so not only minor differences in wordings also even the sequence of the questions is different in different ahadith and that is what we mean to say when we say that quran is verbal revelation even the words are from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> and that is why we use the word revelation not inspiration verbal revelation hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because although five of you who are listening to me all of you are present here you are listening it from right from your horse's mouth you may say but if you are asked to repeat what you heard your wordings will be different it's very usual very natural very normal phenomenon all the all of you o5 white you know agree on the essence but the wording in which you will convey will differ so hadith is also uh, although it is called al wahyu al khafi this is also a revelation from allah subhanahu wa taala muhammad doesn't say it from himself but all the words used they are not from allah subhanahu wa taala so we have fortunately two words in english language revelation and inspiration a revelation is verbal although the christian world says that the revelation also can be only an inspiration they don't believe in verbal revelation and they are forced to do it by because they have four gospels and they differ from each other so they say i asked a learned man of christian faith when i was still a college student we have this gospel of the lord according to saint matthews luke john and so on which one of them is the bible his answer it was very intelligent indeed none of them is bible bible is in them bible is in them but none of them is bible that is why they call it gospel according to saint matthews gospel of the lord according to saint luke Go- gospel of the lord according to saint mark gospel of the lord according to saint john so in the same way this is the level of hadith in islam quran is verbal revelation and there's a very important incident that took place in the life of allama iqbal once he was there in a gathering where the principal of christian uh, former christian college fc college lahore dr ewing was also present and he said remarked allama iqbal i have heard that you also believe in verbal revelation a person learned as you are a philosopher of your stature you believe in verbal revelation that the revelation which came to muhammad was worded by allah subhanahu wa taala himself he said yes i have a personal experience the the poetry that comes to me is already worded even if i like to change the word i can't change the word so this humble thing this is also you know already worded before coming to my my mind so i have this personal experience i believe in the verbal revelation of quran but because they don't have any record such record authentic record of of bible 
the gospel of the Lord. So they say no, verbal revelation is not possible. But this thing is definitely the case with hadith. Words might have changed. Sequence can be changed. But the essence of the hadith is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should understand that this is the primary difference between Quran and hadith. In Quran, every word is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is kalamullah. So it is the revelation. But hadith is not preserved as Quran has been preserved. But you know, wordings of hadith are not sure. There can be difference. So this is very clear. When we read the texts of this hadith, Umm Sunnah, hadith of Jibreel, as narrated by Omar, as narrated by Abdullah ibn Omar, as narrated by Abu Huraira, as narrated by someone else, Ibn Abbas, there are differences in words. But the essence is the same. No difference whatsoever. Even the sequence of questions is also different. The first question in this hadith we should see, it is about Islam. And the second question about Iman. And in the hadith narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu and accepted by Imam Bukhari. In the, the sequence in that is first question about Iman and the second about Islam. Now how this incident or event happened? The Sahaba Kiram, Rizwanullah Ta'ala al Majmain, with were with the Prophet وسلم, in the mosque. And I think it must be the Salatul Fajr. Because after Fajr, it was the usual practice of the Prophet وسلم, to sit there in the mosque for some time. And people used to ask questions. And even Muhammad وسلم, used to ask something from the people. Kaifas Bahta. So, how have you got this morning of today, for example? Secondly, has any one of you seen any dream? And the Sahaba used to narrate to him the dreams that they have seen, so on. So, it's, so to say, there used to be a small gathering, a meeting of the teachers and the disciples for some time. So when they were sitting like this, suddenly a man appeared. As we say it in English, bold from the blue. And the wordings used here by Omar, this hadith which has been chosen by Imam Nabawi, it is not muttafaqun alayh. It has been accepted only by Imam Muslim. <coughs> and this is from Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. Why this choice? Why not the one that is more authentic, accepted by both Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim? Why Imam Nabawi is accepting definitely a lower hadith regarding the authenticity? There must be some reason. And the reason is, this is also a fundamental point that we must understand. That there was, as we know, there was classification among the Sahaba. These are Ashabul Badr, people who were present in the Battle of Badr. These are Ashabul Bayat and Izwan. They are the people who were there, who pledged themselves at the hand of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the event of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and so on. There was gradation. These ten are Al-Asharatul Mubashara. They are the ten for whom Jannah has been guaranteed and foretold by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you need not fear, you'll go straight to Jannah. Al-Asharatul Mubashara. In the same way, there was a division not so definite division as among these people, this gradation, but a commonly known division among the Sahaba. Some were called Al-Fuqaha, Fuqaha Sahaba, people who have deeper understanding. And Al-Fuqara, people who are, who are more at a higher level of piety. Fuqaha Sahaba, and Fuqaha Sahaba. Among the Fuqaha, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Ali, Hazrat Aisha, and so on, Rizwanullah Ta'ala Alayhi Majma'in. Among the Fuqaha, Abu Darda, Abu Zar, Abu Huraira, 
and so on. They were al fuqara min al sahaba, al fuqaha min al sahaba, Umar, Ali, Aisha, رضي الله تعالى عنه. So this hadith, although all although it is at a lower level regarding the authentic authenticity, but it is at a higher level regarding the narrator. Who is narrating it? He is from among the the fuqaha al sahaba. And Abu Huraira is from Fukara, Fukara of Sahaba, and Fukaha, the understanding, the depth of their understanding, has been accepted by the whole Ummah to be more than those people who had their primary concern about piety. As we know, Hazrat Abu Zar رضي الله عنه, one of the most pious companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, so much so that the Prophet has said. من كان يسره أن ينظر إلى زهد عيسى فلينظر إلى صاحب أبي زر. Whosoever wants to see the piety of Jesus عليه الصلاة والسلام, he wants to see with his own eyes how pious was Isa ibn Maryam عليه السلام. He should come and see this companion of mine, Abu Zar. He was so pious, so pious, so virtuous a person. But when he said, "O oh, Ya Rasul Allah, O oh, Prophet of Allah, O oh, Prophet of Allah, make me also some governor at some place. You are sending people. You have sent Maaz ibn Jabal to Yemen as Amil, as governor." The reply was, "Ya Abazar, anta zayifun. You are a weak person. You know because we shall discuss these things later also. But the reason." Why Imam Nabawi has selected the narration of this hadith from Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه instead of the narration given by Abu Huraira رضي الله تعالى عنه is that Umar is from among the fuqaha of Sahaba رضي الله تعالى عليه بجمعين. بينما نحن جلوس عند رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم، حضرت عمر رضي الله تعالى عنه says. It happened once when we were sitting with the Apostle of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, zata yawmin. Once, one day, is tala alayna. When suddenly appeared to us, tala. We use this word for the sun, tala sham, tala ti shams. It comes up. So in the same way, person appeared to us. And now, how much you know? They were wondering who who is, who has appeared suddenly. Shadidun shadidu beyadis seab, shadidu sawadis shar. His clothes were extremely white, no dirt, no dot of any you know thing on his dress, absolutely white, and his hair. Was absolutely black, jet black. La yura alehi asal usafar. No effects of journeying were seen, were visible on him. If somebody has made a journey and he has come straight to Medina and and he has straight come to the mosque, there must have been some dust or dirt on his dress, some dust on his hair. No, his. Clothes were absolutely white. His hair was absolutely black. لا يرى عليه سفر. No effects of any journeying were on him visible. ولا يعرفه من ناحد. And at the same time, none of us could recognize him, who he is. How could Omar say, رضي الله تعالى عنه, that none of us could recognize him? He must have seen. The sign of wonder on the faces of all. If there was anybody in that congregation who recognized him, he would have come forward and greet him. None stood up to greet him. Nobody knew him. So this is a very strange phenomenon that happened. Hatta jala sa ilan nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now this person, you know, proceeded further and further and further, making his way among the people who were sitting around over there. And he reached directly. He sat before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, 
and how much near to him just read the words hatta janasa ila nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam fasnada rukbatayhi la rukbatayhi he joined his knees with the knees of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so close to him all things you know they are they, they feel surprised what is doing who is he how courageous he is how daring he is he has gone so close to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa wada kaffahi ala faqizai and he put his uh, hands the palms of his hands on the thighs of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam literally this can mean he put his hands on his own thighs because you know this pronoun which is here literally according to the basic rules of grammar it can point to both he put his hands on his own thighs or he put his hands on the thighs of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but in other narration of the this hadith as i have told you there are so many narrations we find clearly defined that he put his own hands on the thighs of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now this is the background of this hadith and this incident which we have read today tomorrow inshallah we shall read the text of this hadith subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik